Welcome, one and all, to RFK All The Way, your Twitter space for commentary on Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s presidential campaign. This is Matthew Tower. I'm your host, and I'm joined tonight by the esteemed Lori Spencer, our special guest. Lori is an independent JFK historian and co-host of Maverick News. Lori, introduce yourself a little bit, please, and then we'll jump into the space. Sure. Hi, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Uh, Lori Spencer here, all the way with RFK. I'm in. Let's do this. Awesome. Well, I think this is a very uh, special and historical moment here. We are less than 48 hours away from RFK officially kicking off his presidential campaign. His launch event is here in Boston, very historic location, of course, happening Wednesday at, I believe, 10 a.m. I will actually be there. And wow, I don't know about you, Lori, but what an amazing turnaround this is for us in our country. Just compared to a couple months ago, I don't know about you, but I was feeling quite despondent about the prospects that we would have a presidential campaign who would represent, I think, the values that you and I both share. So how, how are you feeling, Lori, about RFK Jr. Uh, jumping into the race? And maybe you could say a brief word about your past, having tried to uh, draft him, in fact, um, in, in a yeah. previous lifetime. In a, yeah, it was a lifetime ago. It was 15 years ago, actually. Um, I was involved with the Draft Kennedy campaign back in 2008, during the 2008 primaries. We actually started trying to talk Bobby into running in 2007 because we wanted to get a jump on the primaries. Um, but, you know, the time just wasn't right for him at that time. His uh, kids were still quite young. He wanted to focus on being a father, which is great. Um, he had a wife at the time who was not uh, supportive of that. I think she wanted to focus on the family as well. And, you know, the, the momentum of Barack Obama was just unstoppable in 2008. And another reason he didn't want to run was, you know, he had a good friendship with Hillary Clinton and, and he endorsed Hillary throughout the entire primary season of 2008. It wasn't until after the Democratic convention that he endorsed Obama. And that was a split in the Kennedy family. Uh, some of you might remember that. Uh, some of the Kennedys were supporting Hillary Clinton. Some of the Kennedys were supporting Barack Obama. And it caused quite a bit of friction in the Kennedy family. And, and now we see that happening again. Right now that Bobby has announced that he's running, uh, CNN did a piece yesterday, I believe it was, you know, where they tried to get a comment from all of his siblings and other members of the family. Um, and a lot of them chose not to comment. But some who did said that they would not be supporting him. They said they'd be supporting Joe Biden all the way. And that really kind of shocked me. I'm sure it did you, too. Well, actually, not entirely, because I think um, the, some of the positions that um, Kennedy is taking are, you know, qu quite controversial and quite out on the edge of sort of pushing the envelope in a number of ways. And we're going to get into that. So I'm actually not kind of not surprised to see. I mean, you know, we kind of know what the mainstream Democratic Party stands for. And I think um, a President Kennedy, if assuming this happens, and I believe it it will. Oops, we just lost Lori, so I hope she's going to jump back in here. But um, if a President Kennedy does happen, okay, Lori, you're back. So that's good. Let me re-invite you to co-host. So let me get that handled. Um, <clears throat> so what I was what I was saying, Lori, is that um, our our future President Kennedy, I think, will be standing for some positions and some policies that are. Quite a bit more, I, what's the word, progressive? Quite a bit more, in fact, um, almost revolutionary than, than a lot of the mainstream Democratic Party. So why don't we, we go ahead and jump into talking about just, just why do we support RFK Jr. for president? And I know you have, if I remember correctly, four reasons. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to enumerate those four. But I'll just briefly share my big one, which I think is summarized by what I recall RFK Jr. said recently in an interview, which is something to the effect of we cannot have an imperium abroad and a democracy at home. Those two things are not compatible, actually. So, And you've also seen that he's talking about kind of restoring American democracy. So I think 
having having a nation that truly does work for and stand for peace as both his uncle and his father um, modeled um, during during their time in office. And having a, a truly meaningful democracy is very important to me. But I'm going to turn it over to you, Lori, if that's okay, and and ask you to to state your four in turn, your four reasons for supporting him. And then after each one, I'll probably jump into some commentary. The other thing I did want to say for some of our listeners, we actually had um, a Twitter space about maybe a week ago. And for some reason, the recording didn't work. That was probably my mistake. <laughs> I didn't do that <laughs> properly, but I can see the red light is blinking. Linking. It's recording now, so we may cover some of the material we did in the last space and then some new material as well. But, Lori, are you are you good with um, going over your four reasons? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there Please. are so many reasons <laughs> that I support Bobby and have supported Bobby for 15 years. Um, so many reasons. I, I agree with him on most everything. I'd say about 95 percent of the issues. We really don't part ways on much, but there are four big, big issues for me personally that uh, I, I'm basing my vote. These are, these are those lines in the sand for me. When I evaluate a candidate, these are the four things that that candidate must pledge to do um, to get my vote and to get my support. And I hope that in his speech, when he does his campaign announcement, He's going to announce some specifics of his platform. And I hope that these four things will be in that platform. And the first thing, top priority, like first day in office, pardon Julian Assange right off the bat. Save that man's life. He's dying in Belmarsh Prison. And he's been sitting there for four years. It's been four years last week since they dragged him out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, he hasn't been convicted of anything. And in my opinion, he did nothing wrong. He, he did national security journalism, and he did it right. And in you know all these years of existence, WikiLeaks has never once had to issue a retraction on a story. They've you know they've never gotten it wrong. So we need WikiLeaks. We need Julian Assange free, so he can get back to his family and get back to his work. And the sooner the better. Honestly, I don't, I hate to see it wait until January of 2025. That's I hope he makes it that long. And who knows what will happen in the time between now and January 2025. Will they extradite him to the United States? Will the trial be underway by then? Will he be convicted? But as president, he would have the power to issue a, you know, a preemptive pardon. And presidents do that all the time. You know, before someone is actually convicted of any crime, you can put a stop to it right then and there just by issuing a preemptive pardon. And he could he could let Assange go immediately. Lori, if I may jump in here on this, uh, just a couple of things, and I'm going to hand the ball back to you. Um, at the Rage Against the War Machine rally and protest, uh, which was on President's Day in February of this year, um, this was one of the, of the demands, pardon Julian Assange. And I, I found myself, I believe, if I remember correctly, I was in alignment with all 10 of the demands of that event. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like to ask you to do, and let's try to keep this tight because we have a lot of material to cover tonight, but could you give us a very succinct, what was Julian Assange's contribution to the citizens of the United States and the citizens of the world. Like, could you give us that so people can really get a sense of this man's contribution? He told us things that our government would never tell us. He showed us the documents, the secrets, the things they won't declassify, uh, the things that, again, that gets into some of my other points for the Kennedy campaign, but declassification of documents is so important. There's so much overclassification. There's so much secrecy in our government. We need that transparency and we're not getting it from our government. That's the whole reason WikiLeaks was founded in the first place back in 2006 during the Iraq war. You know, we knew that we weren't being told the truth about that war. WikiLeaks showed us the truth and that's real journalism. Journalists aren't, I'm a journalist, been a journalist for 35 years. Our, we have one job, and that's to find the truth and to tell the truth. That's it. It's not our job to be mouthpieces for the government. We're not cheerleaders for any administration. Unfortunately, too many journalists are, and they've forgotten that they have one job, one job, and that's to tell the truth. Julian Assange is one of the only journalists in the world today who does that job and does it right. 
And uh, what would think of all we wouldn't know about the war in Iraq. Think of all we wouldn't know about what the Clinton campaign was up to in 2016. What about Vault 7 and what the CIA is up to with some of their hacking tools? So there's so much that we wouldn't know if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. We all owe Julian a, a great debt of gratitude, and he deserves a pardon and a presidential medal of freedom. <laughs> beautifully said and you're much more of an expert on this topic and on julian than i am but i I just like to chime in with a couple of thoughts um when you watch a video like collateral murder which Mm. he published and just depicts to my understanding you know um the u.s military mass murdering in cold blood iraqi civilians um what we are seeing is like an extreme war crime so there's this terrible tragic irony that you know it's it's very much a metaphorical shoot the messenger here where julian and and let's be clear to my understanding it's not as if julian was on the inside himself it wasn't that he worked for the u.s government and leaked something something was leaked to him and he published it and then he became a targeted messenger a targeted journalist showing the world this war crime when the war criminals themselves walk free and you have people like George W. Bush being celebrated and feted and being sort of publicly almost exonerated and redeemed, at least in a certain portion of the American public's imagination. And, and there's never been any accountability of any kind for these kinds of war crimes. So that's right. the, that's the, the tragical, tragic um, sort of irony and contrast between the one who is exposing the war crimes, the one who is, Saying the emperor wears no clothes, and then essentially he is is, is scapegoated, right? And the only ones who ever go to prison or get prosecuted are the ones who expose the war crimes. Chelsea Manning was sentenced to 35 years for leaking those documents to WikiLeaks, served seven years of that before President Obama commuted Manning's sentence, and still Mm -hmm. Manning does not have a full pardon. So I know that's kind of an extra ask. But I hope that Bobby will go ahead and, you know, take that commutation from Chelsea Manning and go ahead and make a a full presidential pardon out of it. Um, And I also hope that RFK will pardon Edward Snowden while he's at it. Absolutely. I mean, I would love to see a moment where the three of them are not just pardoned, but awarded presidential medals of freedom. Because fundamentally, our nation is made stronger, not weaker, by whistleblowers, by those who either leak or publish those leaks because the fun the, the true question here is when the leak happens what what is it what's the context of it what is it about and in in, in these cases it's whistleblowing and leaking related to government acts of immorality and criminality and how does government immorality and criminality get stopped it gets stopped when people find out about it because without the information there's no way for the public to hold the government accountable in any way um in a, in a democracy or in a pseudo democracy which is unfortunately i think kind of what we live in today and i'm going to get back to that point but Lori, if you unless there's anything else to say about julian since we have a lot to cover do you want to move on to point two yes um uh, you know while you're talking about holding them accountable and i believe that Bobby's the guy who will hold them accountable. I don't believe that any other candidate who's a declared candidate in this race, including Donald Trump, will hold certain government officials accountable for their crimes. And that leads me to my next point, which is prosecuting Dr. Fauci, prosecuting Mm -hmm. Bill Gates, prosecuting all of their cronies who were involved in the COVID pandemic and the creation of vaccines and forcing people to take vaccines that were untested, unproven, Mm -hmm. unknown, putting their health potentially at risk. Now we know how many people, well, we don't even know the true numbers of how many people have had adverse reactions or even died from taking those vaccines. Um, And then we need to get down to the bottom of where the heck did COVID come from in the first place? It's been three years and nobody seems to have an answer for us. All of the intelligence communities have looked into it, they've researched it, and they just can't seem to make up their minds where this virus came from. Um, By now, we should know. And even the CIA recently said they were still undecided about the origins of COVID. 
Now, shouldn't that give you pause after three years? I mean, if they're still undecided after three years, the CIA is either lying or they suck at their jobs <laughs> if they can't figure this thing out in three years' time. Um, we have to get to the bottom of it. We have to hold these people accountable. I don't believe Donald Trump will ever do that. Donald Trump never fired Anthony Fauci. He never fired Francis Collins. He didn't really drain that swamp over there at NIH. Um, I believe that, obviously, Bobby Kennedy is the guy to do that. You know, Lori, it would, it would seem that Bobby Kennedy would <clears throat> uniquely be the person to do that if what, um, what you're saying is, is accurate. You know, I, I do want to provide a little asterisk on my end, which is that I have not gone down this particular rabbit hole the way I have other rabbit holes that I'm going to get to, to my particular set of rabbit holes in a little bit. But, have you um, read his you know, book? Have you read yeah, I book? was I was actually just starting to listen to his the audiobook um, of Great. the real the real uh, Dr. Fauci, the real Anthony Fauci. Have um, you seen but, the but, uh, but, sorry to interrupt. Have I, you seen the documentary? Film? I, I have not yet. I have not yet. So um, but I did want to say a couple of things about this. One is I have been following this story for quite some time about the origins of the pandemic and the possibility that it was a lab leak. And I always believed it was a lab leak from day one. Like I never bought the story that this was of a, a, a zoonotic origin. I mean, basically, I think um, John Stewart perfectly captured my feelings when he kind of went on his hilarious yet all too serious sort of ranty diatribe, you know, when he made, you know, and I, and I think he really punctuated it when he said, you know, if there was an outbreak of chocolatey goodness in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you might go look at the chocolate factory, you know, and if there is a, a <laughs> lab, right, if there is a lab in Wuhan, that is researching, not just researching coronaviruses, but is researching coronaviruses that have been funded through, you know, intentionally um, through a gain of function research program, um, then you might want to look there as the, at, for the origin of the, of the pandemic, as opposed to the wet market, that's alleged wet market, that wet, alleged wet market that is, you know, five miles away. I mean, I'm not saying the wet market was, alleged to be a wet market. I believe it was a real such thing, but, but to allege that that's where the virus started uh, just doesn't really make sense. It doesn't add up, right? And this is just from a common sense standpoint. This is not doing an extreme amount of research and analysis. It's, there are certain things, there are certain moments when you can just use common sense to uh, see through the smoke screen and you can just tell what's really going on right you know it's like when george w bush started talking to the country after 9 11 he started saying these preposterous things like they attacked us because they hate our freedoms it's like that doesn't entirely add up now does it and then you start looking into it well this this is one of the most i think obvious situations we've ever had as Americans where we can just use our common sense to understand that this virus must or most almost like high, high, high likelihood would have come from the coronavirus bioweapon bio research lab a few miles away from the wet market. And if that's true, and you have this chain of funding that passes through Peter Daszak, the EcoHealth Alliance, and Anthony Fauci, that alone is an enormous, enormous amount of liability. And the last thing I wanted to say before I toss it back to you, Lori, is that accountability must be preceded, in my opinion, with the truth. And, you know, if you look at the South African model of how society healed itself post-apartheid, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was an amazing, amazing thing. And it, it, it sort of, the, the deal was, we are going to suspend retribution. We are not going to take retribution against the people who have done these crimes if they tell the truth about it. And if you watch the films about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, it was very, very powerful. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not certainly in a position to say what the, what the penalties should or should not be for Dr. Fauci. What I will say for certainty is that we must have the truth in this and a whole lot of other areas. So I'll toss it back to you on this topic, and then we'll go on to number three. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one more thing about that. I want more than truth and reconciliation. I want compensation for the mm. victims. Mm. Uh, I am a victim. I have had mm. long COVID for three years. I got COVID-19 before it even had a name 
back in January of 2020, before they had a test for it, before they had any treatments for it. Back then, if you went to the hospital like I did when you couldn't breathe, they didn't know what to do with you. I mean, they didn't even know to put us on ventilators. I'm glad they didn't put me on a ventilator. I probably would have died. But, you know, they, they, they prescribed antibiotics and steroids and, you know, an inhaler and told you to go home and rest. And th- they had no idea how to treat COVID back then. So I, I'm one of those people who never really fully recovered from that bout of COVID. And now I've got all kinds of weird health problems that I never had before. And people who have long COVID, our symptoms match almost exactly people who are vaccine injured. Um, science hasn't quite figured out why that is, but it's noted that we have the same symptoms, um, a lot of the same symptoms. Every case is different. But at any rate, our lives have been destroyed. We've been destroyed financially. We've been destroyed physically. Our lives will never be the same. Our bodies will probably never fully recover. And if it's true that the United States government cooked up this virus in a lab, they need to compensate each and every one of us. They need to at least give us Medicare for life so that we can get the ongoing health care we need because the cost of that health care is killing us out of pocket. And a lot of insurers won't cover it. It's, it's interesting you mention, you know, health care for life when <clears throat> fundamentally all Americans, at least from my perspective, should have the kind of socialized um, medicine that is available in every other uh, country um, that is a peer to, to the United States and even countries that are nowhere near as as rich or developed as the United States. And and in fact, you know, if you say, wait, we already do have a social medicine program, it's called Medicare, but for some sort of arbitrary reason, it's you have to be of a certain age to qualify for it. And and to, to have to go through this process of this this injury, and I just want to say my heart goes out to you, Lori, for what you've experienced. It's like it's Thanks. absolutely devastating. And then for that to have to be the to be the rationale. Um it, there, there shouldn't have, it shouldn't be that rationale. It should just be part of what our society is, because we recognize that healthcare is just the baseline. It's, it's part of the baseline of being, being a human in, um, in, in a developed society. You know, while we're um, on the subject of healthcare, I just want to say one thing: the reason that we have Medicare today is President John F. Kennedy. Mm. You know, he's the one who brought us the Medicare program, and when he proposed Medicare, um, he was. You know, he was fought by the American Medical Association, by Mm -hmm. a large majority of Americans. They didn't want, quote, unquote, socialized medicine in the United States. And just to get health care for people over 65 was a tremendous achievement and a tremendous fight that he had to go through against the medical establishment. So my point is that RFK Jr., is not afraid to take on the medical establishment. And I believe that he will fight them in the same way that John F. Kennedy did his uncle. Um, I cannot speak as to Bobby's position on Medicare for all. I have never actually heard him take a position on Medicare for all one way or the other. So I can't speak for him on that. I'm sure he will be asked and he will clarify his position, but Mm -hmm. I would think just based on what I know of Bobby and his family um, that he would support Medicare for all. And if Congress passed it, he would do the thing that, you know, Joe Biden said, if Medicare for all passed Congress and it came to his desk, he would veto it. Mm-hmm. You know, Joe Biden told you that he made no bones mm-hmm. about that. So that's part of the reason why Congress has no will to pass Medicare for all, because they know that President Biden will veto it. We need to put a president in the White House who will not veto it, because all the polls show that a majority of the people at this point in the United States, some 70 percent or better support Medicare for all. And I think that Bobby's listening to us, you know, and, and yeah. his uncle Ted Kennedy was, you know, always he was a 50 year advocate of single payer. He yeah. wanted universal health care for, for Americans. Right. Unfortunately, he didn't get it in his lifetime. All we got was Obamacare, which is not single payer, as we all know. Well, I also think that there is a bit of a a disjuncture or fracture between how how americans kind of perceive the political process and what the the abilities and limitations are of the president versus what's actually possible when you have a president with an extraordinarily 
strong drive and will to achieve something. So here's what I mean by that. You will often kind of have this, this sort of passive aggressive finger pointing going on where you, you'll have, you know, some member of Congress or Senator saying, well, I'm not going to push Medicare for all because I can't, it's not going to pass anyway. It's already, we've already been told that Biden will veto it or Biden will say, well, I'm not going to do this because the Congress wouldn't pass it. Well, all of that goes out the window when you have someone like a president, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who comes in and says, I am going to fight tooth and nail to achieve this. Come whatever. I will fight to get everyone on side to pass this. And then and then suddenly the whole dynamic is totally different. And I think it has been a really, really long time since we've had someone with that level of drive to truly achieve something. Um, so, yeah. So, and, the, and, and also to your point, Lori, just, just to presence this, we are independent here. We do not speak for the RFK campaign. We're just, just talking about it. So um, right. how about we move on to your, I, I love the, the, the Medicare commentary. Let's move on to your point number three, though. I think that's where we had left it off with your four points, right? Yeah. Um, I'll pick up on number three. You know, I was just talking about how there's way too much overclassification and way too much secrecy in our government. And one of the big secrets that they've been hiding <clears throat> from us for 60 years, it'll be 60 years this November, are the documents related to the assassination of Bobby's uncle, President John F. Kennedy. Um, there have been numerous lawsuits. In fact, several JFK historians are currently suing the federal government as we speak, trying to pry those documents out of the government. We should have had them in hand uh, under the 1992 JFK Records Act. Those records were supposed to be released within 25 years, which would have been 2017. At that time, Donald Trump was the president. Trump alone had the power to declassify everything. And he said he would do that. Remember, he put out a tweet saying, I'm going to release all the JFK files. And then, like the next day, he got a visit from the FBI and the CIA, and they talked him out of it. They prevailed upon him to keep those documents secret. Some documents were released on Trump's watch. There were a couple of tranches of documents that kept historians like me busy for a while, but we want them all. And we, those documents should have been in our hands six years ago. And the CIA is playing a game with those documents. And I should also mention, they're also pl playing games with documents that we are still owed under the 1998 Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. That's another one passed by Congress that, you know, mandated the CIA to release and the Pentagon and all government agencies on CIA collaboration with actual Nazis after World War II. Those guys we brought to the United States and put into agencies like NASA and the CIA. <laughs> um, and we've, we've learned a lot from that, but there are still lots and lots of documents of the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act that still have not been released to the public. I would like to see them release those documents as well as all of the remaining JFK documents. And I'd like for him to do it immediately, like day one. I want to see that be a top priority. And I think it's safe to say that we can count on Bobby for, for that. I think that's going to be one of his top priorities. Again, I can't speak for him, but I think he's been really clear about his desire to get all of those documents out to the people so that we can find out for ourselves or make up our own minds with all the information that we have. Um, every person out there can make up their own minds. Now, accountability for whoever committed that crime that's unlikely because I think the, the true killers of President Kennedy are probably dead. Um, and I don't believe that President Kennedy's killer was Lee Harvey Oswald. That's my personal opinion. Um, all available evidence that I've studied in the last 40 years seems to point to the CIA or shall we say independent contractors for the CIA. <laughs> um, but the CIA basically is, uh, in my mind, the culprit. And uh, that's probably why they have some documents they don't want us to see. But the American people have the right to know. Uh, it's a matter of great public interest. And I don't believe that our country has been on the right track since November 22nd, 1963. I think we all felt that change and our country has never been truly great again. I think a lot of people, myself included, 
kind of like Donald Trump back in 19, uh, sorry, 2016, not 1916, <laughs> 2016, uh, when he said he wanted to make America great again. I was hoping that he meant something along the lines of what President Kennedy was trying to do, but he let me down. He disappointed me, and that's why I'm not supporting him this time around. I didn't support him in 2020 either. So great, Lori. Um, a couple thoughts on all of that. So first of all, speaking of the disclosure of crimes, I would like to recommend everyone in this audience, if you haven't read it already, pick up a copy of The Devil's Chessboard by David oh, yes. Talbot, because David this book Talbot. is... I mean, if you want to understand what the CIA was up to in its formative years, you know, so it's sort of like the CIA kind of transformed into this behemoth under the guidance of Alan Dulles. And the allegation in that book is that Alan Dulles was the ultimate sort of mover and master chess player behind JFK's assassination and reading it. It's very, it's very hard for me to sort of not having been there and not having read any primary sources on this, just reading the secondary sources. It's very hard for my common sense radar to, to sort of dispute this idea. And RFK Jr. himself has accused the CIA and has said the CIA was responsible for his uncle's assassination. So I think it's a very important book. I mean, I would go so far as to say that The Devil's Chessboard is a book that every American should read, because I think it would sort of give a, a kind of a true understanding of what what our country is and how it became that way over the last 60 years. Um, and how everything, ties back, to everything ties back to Alan Dulles. If, if the CIA is the mafia, Alan Dulles was the godfather. Yes. And it ties into that Nazi war crimes disclosure act that I was Absolutely. talking about. You know, when you read the devil's chessboard, it does a wonderful job of detailing how Alan Dulles snuck all of these Nazis that should have been prosecuted at Nuremberg and should have gone to prison for the rest of their lives, how he snuck them out of Germany and Ukraine, by the way, um, and brought a lot of those Nazi war criminals over to the United States or got them into Canada or got them into South America and Brazil. I mean, it all goes back to Alan Dulles. So not only did Alan Dulles bring those Nazis into our intelligence agencies, into our government, into our culture, but he also had his paws in the assassination of President Kennedy. That's my, my personal take on it, um, based on the evidence I have seen. And I want the rest of the evidence. I want whatever the CIA still has that they're still hiding <clears throat> from us and, and playing hide-and-go-seek with. It's time for well, that to end. Well, clearly, um, pre our, our next president, Kennedy, would have every incentive in the world to bring some daylight and sunshine onto those records and to finally release them. So I think you would be very likely to get your wish when I think he's the only RFK one Jr. that we can trust. Yeah. He's yeah, the only think, one that we can trust. We'll and, and I think he would not be intimidated or bullied by the CIA the way the CIA has very likely been intimidating and bullying essentially every president. Since, every president since, since 1963. Since, that's right. That's right. Um, so should we, oh, and the other, I just want to say the other book I would recommend to go along just as, you know, starter books on the JFK topic would be JFK and the Unspeakable by James Absolutely. Douglas. Um, yeah. and, and I, I think later I want to let you finish up your four points and then I might make a historical, historical connection there. But Lori, what would be your fourth point for ending the war? We've got to get out of this war in Ukraine. Um, mm. we've got to cut the funding. We've got to cut the flow of weaponry to Ukraine. And I can pretty much guarantee you without America picking up most of the bill for this war and, and most of the responsibility, this war will be over real fast. Mm -hmm. We need to end it, and we need to just get our noses out of it. In my opinion, this is not America's war. This isn't America's business. This is a dispute, basically a border dispute, between Ukraine and Russia. And mm -hmm. it really doesn't concern us. And we, we are wasting billions and billions and billions of dollars that should be going to the American people on mm -hmm. a war that can't be won and that there's no reason for us to be involved in in the first place. It's, it's the same argument that I would have made about the Vietnam War had I been alive back in those years. Uh, and Iraq, Afghanistan, pretty much every war we've been involved in since was really none of our business, except arguably Afghanistan, because we were attacked on 9-11. That was an attack on our shores. Um, and obviously somebody was going to pay for that. 
But uh, all these other wars that we're involved in, especially this one, this one's the most dangerous of all, because this one can escalate us to World War Three. You know, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Syria do not have nuclear weapons. But Russia does. China does. Mm-hmm. North Korea does. And here we are trying to pick a fight with everybody, it seems right now. We want to it seems as though the Biden administration is literally trying to start World War Three and pushing other nuclear powers into backing them into corners, which is never a good thing to do with your adversary, especially if they have nuclear weapons. I mean, what are we doing here? We've got to end this war. And uh, I, I believe based on the statements I've heard Bobby make thus far, um, that he would agree with a lot of what I just said. I think that uh, he feels it's not in America's best interest to be involved in this war at all. And I, I also hope, I, I haven't heard him speak on this topic, but I, I hope he'll get us out of NATO as well. Well, a few thoughts on that. Um, <clears throat> Bobby recently tweeted um, almost kind of a, a, a mini essay in which he sort of tied together an indictment of the neoconservatives and their uh, their so-called project for a new American century. We may remember that that was a, I can't remember if that was a think tank or a white paper or a mixture of the two things, but the project for a new American century was this this concept about how basically the U.S. was going to dominate the world, starting with a new Pearl Harbor, which would motivate the American populace to s- support these kind of wars abroad. Um, and then, of course, 9-11 happened not long after the idea of a new Pearl Harbor was advanced by the Project for a New American Century. And, you know, and Bobby talked about the kind of this ne- the neocon drive to sort of motivate and animate these wars and the and the, the bankruptcy of that and and <clears throat> included his criticism of, of funding and arming this Ukraine proxy war amongst other criticisms. But I wanted to just bring in a, cu- a few points here, Lori. One is let's start with a quick historical analogy. I think something that is vastly um, underappreciated and not fully understood by the American public is the the reality and the truth, I believe, I, I would submit this, that none of us would be alive today if it wasn't for President John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert conducting back-channel diplomacy with Soviet Premier Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis. People do not truly understand how close we were to nuclear annihilation and how much pressure President Kennedy was under from his cabinet, from his joint chiefs of staff, from base, almost his entire military were prodding and provoking him to invade Cuba and attack Cuba when the USSR had positioned missiles there. And fortunately, John Kennedy and and cooler heads, a small number of them sort of prevailed. And he conducted this off the record back channel. His his military didn't even know these negotiations were going on. Kennedy at that point started to realize that he wasn't, as he said, in full control of his own military. So he had to do this sort of off the record and and cut a deal that that he didn't even disclose to the American public, which was to remove U.S. nuclear missiles from Turkey in exchange in quid pro quo for the USSR removing their missiles from Cuba. And so so here's the relevance to this today. Think about President Biden and what we saw in the fall of last year when, Lori, I think you and I both had a very high spidey sense in the fall of last year that the US was closer, or I'm sorry, the world was closer to nuclear war than it had been at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines was one of a multitude of, of events that happened kind of in a very compressed two week period where yeah. we seemed to be at very high danger. But during that time period, President Biden infamously said, we are closer to nuclear Armageddon than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. He, he said this in an interview on camera mm-hmm. and almost in the same. And presidents, back, said, I mean, you never hear a president say that even at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. President Kennedy never used such strong words like nuclear Armageddon. I mean, yeah, was the strongest words possible we've never heard words like that from an american president and and just that one time i think joe biden might have been correct 
Yeah, occasionally, you know, you will, it's like the expression from the mouths of babes, you know, occasionally you'll hear the, you know, these statements slip out of Biden that are actually almost him kind of telling the truth about something in a way that right. you imagine, you imagine that someone is cringing backstage and saying, oh, I wish he wouldn't have said that, like what he yeah, said. Yeah, about- and then the White House comes out the next day with a correction, you know, they're like, oh, well, he said that, but he didn't really mean that. What he meant to say was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know, they want to walk that dog back. But, you know, you would kind of think, in, in kind of um, a best of all worlds, if you, if you want the, like, the best case scenario is if you hear the president of the United States of America say, we are closer to nuclear Armageddon than we've ever been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. What you would hope is immediately after that comment, they would say, and we are doing everything in our power to diplomatically negotiate de-escalation, a path out. And, an, and a cooling down of tensions to ensure that doesn't happen. That would be the sort of statement that would be like, if you don't make that statement immediately after the nuclear Armageddon comment, you must be fired. You like have no business being the leader of a nation that is nuclear armed. But he didn't say that. He said almost exactly the opposite of that. What he said was, in I'm, I'm pretty sure in the same interview, or if not in the same interview, it was, it was certainly very close to that interview. He said essentially two things. One, I'm not going to talk to President Putin directly. No, I will not be doing that. And I, no, that's not going to happen. And then he, he made this bizarre comment, which was nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, which translates as, you know, there will be no negotiation about the end of this war without the involvement of Ukraine, which, I mean, certainly, obviously, it goes without saying that Ukraine and its and its president must have a seat at the table. However, that does not preclude a nuclear armed nation from negotiating with another nuclear armed nation to ensure that those weapons are not used. I mean, this was it's almost like so insane that it could have easily been an episode of Black Mirror, if anyone's ever watched that series mm. on Netflix, but it's happening in real life. And um, and then the other thing is that, that, you know, if the leak is to be believed, and I certainly have no reason to doubt this, there was a negotiation happening between the Ukrainian side and the Russian side in April of last year. So like something like a month after the invasion, there was a negotiation and I believe it was being mediated by Turkey. And then the story is, the story is that the United States basically directed Boris Johnson, um, former prime minister of the UK to go in and kind of scotch the negotiations and ensure that those negotiations were, did not proceed with promises to to President Zelensky that I don't know. He would. I, I believe that the the promise from I, again. This is all what we've heard. I don't know for sure, but what I've heard is that so some sort of assurance was given to President Zelensky that he would get more if he stayed at war, and he would get more territory or something if he stayed at war, as opposed to negotiating with with Russia. Now, what? And then and then you connect it and okay. Well, what's really going on here? What's really going on when you have the president of the United States refusing to negotiate with Putin in direct contrast with how JFK handled the missile, the missile crisis, which, by the way, did involve a third party and involved Cuba, but ultimately was about the U.S. and the and USSR in terms of them being the superpowers. That's kind of like there's an analogy yeah, here. There's... To point that out, that Castro was unfortunately excluded from those negotiations. That was just Kennedy and Khrushchev who negotiated the end of the missile crisis. Castro much and he was mad about it but he was left well, out of, of that well he well he certainly got got something out of it because part of the part of the negotiations were that um President Kennedy pledged that the United States would not invade Cuba which was a very understandable yes. um <clears throat> concern of Castro's after the uh, the Bay of Pigs but anyway so 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 the point being here is like well what's really going on well we've had plenty of American officials make statements along the lines of well what we want to do here is weak in Russia. And and we've had, you know, American senators and officials say things to the effect of if, if Ukrainians are willing to use our weapons and fight and die to quote unquote weaken Russia, then then we should support that. Um, and of course, before even before the invasion, we had numerous U.S. officials, including um, Victoria Newland and 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 Senator Ted Cruz, and of course President Biden himself, before the invasion, threatened to quote unquote put an end to the Nord Stream pipeline. Right. So so there there are a lot a lot of things happening here that I think if the American public 
truly understood all these dynamics, which of course they don't because we live in such a propagandized society. Um, if they actually understood what was happening here and they could see this isn't as simple as what has been conveyed to them. It is not as simple as, I mean, I'm just, this is the way I've been thinking about it, Lori, is it sort of conveyed like, hey, Ukraine was over there minding their own business. They were just doing a bunch of nothing for years, decades. Ukraine was doing a bunch of nothing. And then suddenly, out of the blue, out of nowhere, totally unprovoked, Russia invaded Ukraine. It's like, no, that's not exactly what happened. In fact, nothing could possibly be further from the truth. This, mm -hmm. from my perspective, at least, at least studying history and taking a moment to look at this, as opposed to being unprovoked, this was one of the most preposterously, overtly over-provoked conflicts you could imagine. It's, you know, metaphorically, the United States has been punching the bear in the nose over and over again with NATO expansion. After the United States promised not to expand NATO, the United States kept on expanding NATO. And I don't know about you, Lori, but one of the things I find is that it seems that there is almost this inability among some Americans, I think, to empathize with the other side. And this is so, so important. And it's something that President Kennedy and his brother did so well and so effectively. And when you read JFK and the, and the Unspeakable by James Douglas, you find out that President Kennedy was like, he was like on a personal mission to understand and empathize with Premier Khrushchev so that the two of them could prevent the ultimate atrocity nuclear war by having a human relationship. And if you say empathy is about putting yourself in the shoes of the other and walking a mile or a marathon or as long as it takes until you, until you understand their experience. And all you have to do if you're an American is imagine how would we feel? How would we feel if something like this was going on, something roughly like this was going on that after we lost the Cold War and the Soviets won, and then they promised, you know, here's the deal as part of the whole, we're going to have a, a solution on Germany, but we're never going to expand the Warsaw Pact. And then they kept expanding it. And then they, they extended an invitation to Mexico to join the Warsaw Pact. I mean, it doesn't take that much of a leap of imagination to understand how threatening it must be for Russia, for NATO to expand eastwards. And the point is not whether or not we believe that it should be threatening. I, I've talked to people who say, well, Russia shouldn't feel threatened by it. It's like, well, that does, that's not what matters. What matters is whether Russian, especially the Russian leadership, right, the Russian elites and President Putin himself and, and his generals and whoever else is, is sort of influential and in the top ranks, do they feel threatened? Do they feel threatened, yes or no? If the answer is yes, then you start to understand some of, some of what's going on here. Um, and and I think I you know I'm I, I'm going on for a while here, Lori, but I'll try to wrap it up and bring it back, give it back to you. My last thing I wanted to say is I think that the the Ukraine situation it's so multifaceted. It's like three things simultaneously. I think it is simultaneously okay, um, a civil war and a, a a civil war inside Ukraine and a border dispute between Russia and Ukraine and. On top of all that, it is a U.S. covert proxy war against Russia. And all three of those things are happening simultaneously. And, and it's hard to see those three things and the way those three things intersect without spending some real significant time picking it apart. But, Lori, I want to bounce it back to you for a moment on this topic. And Yeah, yeah I just had a couple of thoughts to add to that. Um, you know, this is a war that, as many people who study the history of U.S.-Russia relations understand has been going on for more than 100 years. Really, ever since the revolution of 1917 in Russia, the United States has deemed themselves an enemy of that country, whether it was the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation. Uh, we have, except for a very brief period for a few years during the Roosevelt administration in World War II, that we had an alliance with the Soviets, of course, uh, to win the war. And then as soon as that war was over, really even before the war was over in 1945, the Cold War gets underway and suddenly our former ally is now our enemy. <laughs> and we spent the next 40 years trying to destroy them. And one of the ways that we tried to destroy them, and this is something that we know thanks to the, the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act, we have documents now that show us that 
our friend Alan Dulles. There he is again. Wherever there's trouble, you'll always find Alan Dulles. Well, there's Alan Dulles over there, you know, not only recruiting Nazis in Ukraine to come to North America, but also arming them, funding them, these Banderite groups, these mm-hmm. rebels, if you will. They, it, he was training, arming, and funding them to wage go- guerrilla warfare against the Soviet Union. It was our effort at regime change. And that was going on in the 1950s and in the 1960s and really up until the Soviet Union fell, then there was no need for that program anymore. But I would argue that that has continued to exist even after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the turn of the 21st century, when we suddenly decided that we couldn't work with President Putin, he was not going to be a sober Yeltsin that we wanted him to be. And he was, you know, he was going to put Russia first. Uh, that's when we started to pull those files, I think, back out of the archives and said, hmm, the Ukrainian nationalists, they've always been our friends. We can use them to wage a proxy war against the Russian Federation. And that's exactly what happened. With, you know, with the revolution in 2003 that wasn't successful, the one that was successful in 2014, which is really where the current war began. Um, and it's been going on ever since. What happened in 2022 was just a major escalation of that war. Um, yeah. But yeah, another thing I wanted to say about that is, you know, on the eve of World War II, when it was obvious that things were escalating towards the United States getting involved in the war, uh, Robert Kennedy's grandfather, Joseph P. Kennedy, was at that time ambassador to the Court of St. James in England. And he was desperately trying to stop that war. He was trying to keep us out of that war. And he gave a speech that always stuck with me when he said that, uh, you know, he had nine children. And he said, I've given nine hostages to fortune. Meaning that, you know, if there's a a world war, my boys are going to get drafted and I could lose them. And in fact, he did lose a son in that war. He lost his eldest, Joseph, and uh, almost lost Jack. In the PT-109 incident, you know, uh, he was lucky to have survived that. Uh, But Joe Kennedy, those words come back to me now when I look at where Bobby Kennedy is now. He's now a grandfather. Uh, He's given six hostages to fortune. He's got six children. And one of his children, his son Connor, who's like 27, 28 years old, he's actually gone over there. He joined the International Legion and he fought. He did a tour of duty in Ukraine doing actual well, you know, in Ukraine for combat. Ukraine. He, he fought on the, on the Ukrainian side, just to be clear. That's correct. Right? Yeah. That's correct. And he supports Ukraine. His son does. Um, and, you know, I have to take my hat off to Connor for doing that rather than uh, just, you know, talking a good game online and being a keyboard warrior. He actually picked up a gun and he went over there and he put his body where his mouth is. And, and I have to respect that. I respect that. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, what Bobby has to say about this war and what his thoughts are on how to bring it to an end. Um, And and also about the Ukraine leaks, you mentioned those a few minutes ago. I just wanted to say that the Ukraine leaks proved that pretty much everything Scott Ritter has been telling us for over a year was true, was factual and was correct. Scott Ritter has been telling us for quite some time now that U S special forces were in Ukraine actually taking part in combat. The Ukraine leaks just confirmed that. Scott Ritter also told us that Ukraine is losing the war, contrary to what the media tells us, contrary to what the government tells us. Russia is actually winning this thing. And I just wanted to bring up Scott Ritter because he deserves a shout out. Um, Just as he was correct about Iraq not having weapons of mass destruction before we went into the Iraq war, he has once again been vindicated. He has once again been proven correct. And yet he is still silenced shadow banned and even suspended off many social media platforms, including this one. And I want to give a shout out to Jeff Norman, our friend Jeff Norman, good friend of Scott Ritter, co-host of Scott Ritter's twice weekly show, Ask the Inspector. Yeah, Jeff Norman's in the house with us tonight. Hi, Jeff. Um, and I, I hope that he will step up to the mic and say a few words, too. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, let's open the floor yeah. if anybody well, wants to actually. Speak. Actually, Lori, I had a few things I wanted to finish oh, say yeah, before yeah, before we do um, some guest speakers. So, um, you know, you know, just coming back to you, you had mentioned the you know the 
Scott and the weapons of mass destruction lie, right? Like there's certain, there's certain lies that are so big and powerful and all consuming and they get repeated over and over and over nefariously and intentionally by people in power to sort of almost hypnotize and put into a trance the American people to support a certain agenda. In other words, if you tell the American people over and over again, you know, Saddam has links to Al Qaeda. Saddam is trying to obtain significant quantities of uranium from Africa in order to build nuclear weapons. Like all of these. Things oh, and don't forget utter- the anthrax and the anthrax, <laughs> which we anthrax. which we later, which RFK Jr. has revealed that came from from the CIA. That actually the CIA had taken over a bioweapons lab and had and that at least this is his allegation. I I can't prove whether it's true or not, but I have no reason to dis- disbelieve our presidential candidate here. I mean, and I'm paraphrasing what I remember hearing him say in a recent interview where he said, you know, if you go back to sort of um, post post 9-11, there were these um, envelopes containing anthrax that were sent to certain members of Congress um, who were the ones who were opposing the Patriot Act. And and that you that that if you did the detective work, you would find out that the, the anthrax apparently came from the CIA who had taken over a bioweapons lab that had, I believe, if I'm remembering this correctly had been shut down actually as far back as I, I believe the Nixon administration. So, so anyway, um, let me, let me just finish this train of thought here about the, the lies. So, so you get these lies that are told big enough and intensely enough, you know, about Saddam being a, a threat to the American people. You get, uh, you know, you go back to the Vietnam war with the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident and, and the lie that, that we were attacked there. You, and so here, the lie that is being sp- said over and over again is just that word unprovoked. It's it's punched again and again and again, unprovoked, 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 which then feeds into the everybody who is opposed to the United States is the next reincarnation of Hitler. And I'm old enough to remember when um, the first George Bush said that Saddam Hussein was worse than Adolf Hitler. I remember him saying that, and I looked it up, and there it was. If you Google the expression, worse than Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, George w. George Bush, you will find that article. Okay, so so this this idea you mean that H. President W. His dad. Yes, the first yeah, the first George, George Bush, the first yeah. George H. W. Bush during the first Gulf War in what year was that? I believe nineteen ninety, if I remember correctly. It was nineteen ninety one. One ninety one. Sorry, ninety one. So you go to nineteen ninety one, you find that George H. W. Bush said that Saddam Hussein was worse than Adolf Hitler. You will find that quote, and so this if if. If you if you can convince the entire American public that Russia had zero justification, it was entirely unprovoked. Right. Then you can cast President Putin as a Hitlerian um, nemesis who is bent on conquest. And you don't have to mention anything about all the ways that the United States did provoke this by expanding NATO and by getting ins- itself involved in the 2014 coup, right? Um, right? And none of that is to say that what Putin did was right here. It's not to say that what Russia did was right. It's just to say that the word unprovoked is a complete and total fallacious lie. It is, the big, it is as big of a lie as you could possibly tell about this situation. But once you tell that line, you get everyone on board with it and you've got your Operation Mockingbird lined up. You've got all the media repeating it over and over. The public becomes almost in a trance, right? And we'll just kind of keep keep supporting um, what's going on. So that's the first thing right. I would say. But then, but then let's bring it back to RFK Jr. So fundamentally speaking, um, the ultimate goal here is not to assign blame. You know, at the end of the day, if you actually want a ceasefire and you want a durable peace agreement, you don't get that by proving in the court of public opinion or anywhere else who is at fault. What you do is you find a way to come up with a resolution to the conflict that meets the needs of the parties while having maybe the parties having to let go of certain dreams of theirs, right? But you have to find a path forward that says this is an acceptable path forward. That's how you get to peace, not by figuring out who is at fault. And and I think we have a model here. We have a model for how but the first president, Kennedy, found a path forward with Premier Khrushchev. And I really believe that 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 
President uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. would do that if he were president today. And I think he would do it immediately with President Putin. And I think I he would do it. Never, and we, we and need that. We desperately and, need a Potsdam conference. We need a Yalta conference. We we need to get these parties. Or, or even a back or even just the kind of back channel that we had. I mean, sometimes peace even is made that. through these through these very off the record you know, with 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 um, clandestine uh, diplomacy, even with citizens who are deployed. I mean, whatever it would take, I think you would find the the graceful and artful way to do that. Um, So and and that just kind of brings connects in with what I want to say about the reason. And I think here's what I'm going to suggest we go do, Lori, is that we go to 950 Central Time, 1050 East Coast Time, if that's okay. I'll go a couple more minutes and then we'll bring up some speakers. What I want sure. to just just sort of weave together is well, what is my number one reason for supporting RFK Jr. for president? I think it's it's this sort of the intersection between the following <clears throat> because it all ties together. None of what I'm about to say stands on its own. It's all interweaved together. It is the transformation of the United States as the bully, oppressor, and conqueror in on the global stage to a cooperator on the global stage. We must fundamentally be a cooperator on the global stage, okay? And there are a lot of different ways to cooperate. It's just what we have to, like that is the fundamental approach that I think JFK um, was attempting to take, right? And, And you could hear it in what I would submit as the most important and best speech any president has ever given, which was, on June 10th, 1963, JFK's speech at, at, at American University about the most important topic, peace, right? Yeah. And he ta- and, and the way he talked about it, he was very clear that this is not the peace of dreamers and idealists. This is about practical steps in cooperation with with your with other global players, including though someone like the Soviet Union, who we might have believed to be an adversary, but we can we must re-examine our own attitudes. We must look at how we can shift from this adversarial stance to a cooperative stance. So when we shift out of this imperial conquering stance into a cooperative stance, it's almost like like you imagine like Gulliver's pinned down and suddenly the ropes are free. Like so it, it frees up all of this other energy. We don't need to continue to bankrupt ourselves on foreign wars of aggression. You know, what, what is war? War is a racket. You know, we, we can read the, this Medley Butler book and we can discover war is, here's my description of it. War is the conversion of brainwashed young people's bodies into profits for those who manufacture the weapons for that war, right? Like that is fundamentally what war, war, and especially in today's age, it is the absolute nature of war. So the the military industrial complex is always gonna be on the lookout for the next war, as long as we're the aggressor and as long as we're in that stance. Afghanistan wrapped up and suddenly what's happening, we are once again converting, but instead of converting American bodies, it's Ukrainian bodies. But think about this, Lori, for a moment. Imagine if there was a draft today. Imagine if American kids were being drafted and sent to Ukraine. I don't know if it would be as... I I think there's a a way in which uh, the American public is a little bit asleep right now. And I think they're not quite looking at the the, the the sort of dunderheadedness of all of this and the way that we're so almost sleepwalking into World War III with Russia. But I do think that there would at least be much more of a debate if there if suddenly it was not not just even a, a voluntary um, American army like we had with the Iraq War, but if there was a draft, oh my gosh, that the debate today might be just as intense as what happened with Vietnam. But in any That's- case, I think what, what President Kennedy um President RFK Jr. W- would do would be, he would he would shift he would lead that shift because he has said we can't have an imperium we can't have an empire abroad and a democracy at home so suddenly we are a cooperator we are a good neighbor on the global stage and I think that would release so much energy to sort of redevelop at home as well for us to become a country that really does if we're not spending fifty plus percent of our budget on the war machine. And, and there's and and that amount of expenditure is greatly reduced. I mean, if you add up all of the money we have ever spent since the death of JFK, if you add up all the money we have sent, spent on these crazy foreign wars, how close would that total dollar amount be to our current national debt? 
right? So the debt we have, we've built up a debt that has been essentially based on enriching the military industrial complex and its contractors. Um, and, and, and we've just been printing money and we've created inflation. So we have to, we have to get it all sort of, re- it almost is like we need a USA 2.0. We need a reboot of what this country is. And the last part, and this also relates to it, is, is just democracy. In other words, since November 22nd, 1963, I think mostly speaking, um, elected representatives have been figureheads. And there's been this, some latitude they've had around certain topics, especially hot button topics, topics that cause a lot of sort of fr- in other words, I think I think the the MIC, the military industrial complex and the CIA wants to see Americans believing that they're engaged in a democracy because blue is going to support this particular policy and red is going to support this other policy on certain domestic issues, um, like perhaps gun gun ownership or abortion. But when it comes to the big questions, the big questions of war and peace and are we going to have foreign wars, there isn't, it's not even that we have a uniparty, as some people say, it's that we have a milita- a covert military industrial complex CIA Fa- you know, organization, almost kind of like a loose fascism there that is running the whole thing behind the scenes. And I think that does come to an end under a President Kennedy Jr. as part of the vision I've just outlined. At least this is my theory. This is my theory of the case. So would you care to God, respond to my so. theory of the case, Lori, before we uh, ask some folks to talk? I I really hope so. I hope you're right. I, uh, you know, I must say, I have to give some credit where it's do to Donald Trump. Um, he tried his best to be a president of peace. And believe me, that's not easy to be the president of the United States and try to make peace with our so-called adversaries. Um, his trip to North Korea was a, a great step forward. And unfortunately, those negotiations were tanked by people like John Bolton, by these swamp rats that Trump hired into his administration who tried to talk him out of every good idea he ever had. Um, And, you know, Trump even now talks a really good game about, I alone will be the guy to end the war, so he says. But it's important to remember that Trump has, you know, he has some blame on his shoulders as well. He armed Ukraine to the teeth back in 2019, stepped up the funding and weaponry to Ukraine a great deal, which greased the skids and, and set the, set the stage for the war that we're in right now. So is, I do believe can I, push, can I push back on you for a moment on this, Lori? Sure. I, my, my understanding, and I'm just going to pick one example here because I'm sure there's a, there's a lot to talk about, but I, I, my understanding is that Trump um, avoided at least one uh, nuclear arms control treaty and spent a fair amount of money, quote unquote, modernizing as in building new nuclear weapons. So yep. I, I have a hard time buying the idea that he really was. I, 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 I will give like where credit where credit is due. I think having a relationship with the leader of North Korea is probably a better idea than not having a relationship with him because you don't want to end up in you have no relationship with someone who you could end up in a nuclear war with. That's insanity. And so, so I do think there, you know, you, you bring up a point here, which is bringing, building some personal bridges is better than not. However, I, I would say it's, it's certainly at, at a mixed bag here when you contrast that move with the way he um, pulled out of a, a nuclear arms control agreement and, and poured more money into building more nuclear weapons. We oh, absolutely. And, and I was hoping that Trump would keep his campaign promise of 2016 and build that bridge of friendship with Russia, which is what he said mm-hmm. he was going to do. And then he got into office, of course, and he starts getting bad advice from bad people who were telling him we've got to, you know, Russia's the enemy. We've got to ramp up this Cold War. We, we can't uh, be in an arms control treaty with Russia. And, and all of that Cold War rhetoric was really ramping up under Trump. And he also did the same thing with China. On the one hand, he tried to have good relationships with Xi Jinping. On the other, certainly once the pandemic started, I mean, he he was demonizing China in every speech and he continues to demonize communist China in every speech that he gives. You know, he's staunchly anti-communist. And I'm afraid that he's a bit too much of a war hawk uh, for my taste right now. I'm not so sure he's that man of peace that he 
proclaims himself to be. So I agree with yeah. you. He talks a good game about um, waging peace, but I really haven't seen much evidence of that. And he had he had four years to show us what he could do and really only made things worse in a lot of ways, uh, leading Joe Biden to just pick up the torch and make it even worse than it was under Trump. But uh, one thing for sure, there won't be a Potsdam conference or a Yalta conference or back channel negotiations or a peace treaty as long as Joe Biden is president. <laughs> and on Trump, I mean, he says every speech that he gives, I can end this war tomorrow, he says. I can get Zelensky and Putin talking to one another, and I, I alone can fix it, right? But my question well, to Trump is, why aren't you on a plane to Ukraine right now? You've got your own plane. I mean, every other world leader has flown over to Ukraine to meet with Zelensky except you. And you may not be the president at the moment, but even as a private citizen, as the former president, like Jimmy Carter did when he was trying to negotiate peace in the Middle East, why not go over there and be a diplomat? If that's what you say you're good at, show us. I mean, more power to you, buddy. Go over there right now. Go talk to Putin. Go talk to Zelensky. Why wait until January 2025 to get started on this? Why not, why not start today? Well, I, I would like to not put too much more space into Trump discussion. I want to bring it back to RFK at a moment because that's what we're here for. I just wanted to say something about the overall kind of just an observation I have about some of the language you were referring to and what I see as this very unfortunate fallacy of thinking amongst the American general public that is so deeply reinforced and and and, and almost you know, propagandized through media, movies, the news, and all of it, which is which is this kind of black and white good guy, bad guy thinking. Like, in other words, either Russia is the big bad guy, or we're going to be friends with Russia. Like, either Russia is terrible and Putin is terrible, or like we're going to be friends with Russia, but then you're bad if you're friends with Russia. And like, this is completely the wrong way to be thinking about it. Like, that entire framework is the wrong way to be thinking about it. In my opinion, what I believe is, is is a more helpful and productive way to think about stuff like this is the framework of conflict resolution. In other words, there's a there's a there's a an institute that that specializes in international conflict resolution that I very much admire. Um, and one of their directors, her name is Susan Collin Marks, what she says over and over again is violent conflict destroys everything. Right? Violent conflict destroys everything. So you you look at a situation like What's happening with Russia and Ukraine and U.S. and NATO, because we are very much part of that. We are, we are in fact, the United States is, is a co-belligerent in this situation. And, and then you say, all right, let's analyze this conflict. Let's look at what are the legitimate needs of all of the parties. And then you also kind of have to look at, well, what are the illegit illegitimate needs of the parties? What are, what are things the part, some of the parties might be saying that they want here that really just like there's no, there's no backup to this? Like, you know. I mean, if you were to say, um, like, you know, our need, like, if, if we were to say, okay, I want to give you an example. If the United States and or Ukraine were to say, the only acceptable outcome is Putin must not be in power, which, by the way, we, we have basically said, like, at one point, President Biden said something to that effect, this man cannot remain in power, and then they tried to walk that back. Furthermore, Zelensky has said, um, that he will not negotiate with Russia unless Putin is no longer the president. Well, guess what? That's not a legitimate position for either us to have or Zelensky to have because we don't get the United States does not get to choose who's in charge of Russia and has no basis and no right to make that any more than Russia has the right to decide who our leader is. And the same thing is true of, of Ukraine having that attitude towards Russia. It may be that Zelensky has all kinds of legitimate grievances here, but he doesn't get to determine who is in charge of Russia any more than he would want Russia to determine who's in charge of Ukraine, right? So you have to kind of sort out, like, what are the legitimate needs and look at it through a, a conflict analysis standpoint and then say, what resolves this conflict? And I think very few Americans kind of have been exposed to the kind of education that would have them look at things through the lens of conflict resolution instead of good guy, bad guy. And I think President and our future President Kennedy would be able to look at it through the lens of conflict resolution, just like his uncle and his father did. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, Lori, did you want to say something else about that before I start inviting some folks up on the stage? 
Uh, just one thing. I do want to remind people that uh, Russia has an election coming up also in 2024. Their next presidential election is scheduled in uh, March of 2024. Um, so it's unclear when we talk about regime change whether Putin will win re-election in 2024 or if it'll be somebody else that the next president of the United States will have to be dealing with in this conflict. It may or may not be Vladimir Putin. There's about to be either a regime change or not, but they're going to have an election <laughs> in March well, of 2024. And, and, and I think, you know, something something actually President Putin said is, is that Russia, from his standpoint anyway, I'm just repeating something he said, you know, you can criticize it or not, but he said one of his beliefs is that countries should not interfere with the internal affairs of other countries, right? So in other words, whoever Russia's leader is and whoever that person is, however that's determined and whether or not that that is a, you know, sort of a fair process or not, is none of our business. It's not, it's not the United States. It's not up to the United States. Um, and so we have to deal with the world as it is and with the leaders of countries as they are essentially. So um, anyway, I, I just want to wrap it up. I, my commentary just by saying I really do think that this is a once in a not just a once in a generation because generations come every what 20 years like this is a once in a lifetime moment once in a lifetime that we this is a once in a lifetime moment that we have someone who has a certain combination of qualities he like RFK Jr. is an outsider in that he's never to my understanding held elected office right so he's not a, right. a, a career politician he has spent his entire life fighting for what he believes in, including um, on, on, on environmental topics. You know, if you haven't already, look up his background um, on, on filing lawsuits to, against the EPA to, to protect the environment and people and, and fishermen and rivers. Um, and, and obviously on the vaccine topic, which isn't my, is not my forte, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very compelling topic, but, but most, imp but most importantly, he brings in this, this very sophisticated, detailed, I think, critical analysis of power, of the intersection of corporate, military, state, media power, and a vision for, as he says, you know, restoring American democracy. Like we can actually have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people once again, which we, in my opinion, have not had since November 22nd, 1963. So this, this is a potentially potentially transformational and even revolutionary campaign. And I am so excited that it's happening and that we get to witness it. And I will be um, attending the campaign kickoff Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. So, so that'll right. be super, super fun. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to just. You're in Boston right now, right? You're I am in Boston, Boston and I'll. Way. Yep, that's right. I, and uh, I will be there Wednesday at 10 a.m. So, um, and uh, we'll do another one of these spaces, uh, you know, a week from today, same time at uh, 8 30 p.m central um 9 30 p.m eastern 6 30 pacific so please raise your hand if you would like to come up on stage we're going to do i think this this went a little longer than i thought but we're going to do i think 10 minutes max of guests um so do raise your hand if you want to come on stage and either make a comment or ask a question of Lori or myself yep just raise your hand hit that little uh, icon so that we know you'd like yeah. to speak and we've got a request Great. From and, Jim. Jay, and jay i'm going to bring you up and I, the one thing i do want to say is please keep your comment or question to i'm going to say 90 seconds so keep it tight and uh, that way we can get through a couple people so um jay you are invited i know it's going to take a moment to connect you so jay are you there jay you are muted sorry hello can you hear me now Hello. Yep. Loud and clear. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, first of all, thanks for putting this event together. Um, I think that point you mentioned at the end about this being a really important moment in time um, is a, a really one that everyone should um, really harp on and consider because the state of the economy um, is not <laughs> like in the state of the economy is in a, a very worrisome spot right now. But that can be the catalyst um, for change. And I do believe that RFK um, is that change for a lot of the reasons you guys said, um, but in particular, um, also because of his stance on Bitcoin. Um, I don't know how much attention you guys pay to um, digital currencies, but uh, one of the things JFK did was remove the power of um, the money 
I'm sorry, remove the power of the money printer from the Federal Reserve. And Bitcoin is like a 21st century way of doing that. So I am excited about how um, RFK Jr. Um, does seem to be um, embarking on that same journey because the central banks is one of the main ways that they are able to finance um, a lot of these wars. So, but, um, but overall, you know, um, thanks for putting this together. I'm really excited about the campaign. And yeah, um, it was a great presentation you guys made. Well, thank you for that thanks, comment, Jay. Jay. And I, I just wanted to piggyback on that for a moment. Um, for folks who want to go a little deeper into the point Jay raised, just go through RFK Jr.'s uh, Twitter feed and you will find that he tweeted about this topic. And what, and he pointed out a couple of things that are really important. One is, the, uh, is that there could be coming a central bank digital currency. So think of a central, central bank digital currency as, as being a Bitcoin-like instrument, but Instead of it being independent and, and decentralized and censorship resistant, it's exactly the opposite. It's, it's a way for the Federal Reserve to control um, the uh, Americans' access to their funds um, directly and monitor everything we do. So imagine you're using this, this thing called the Fed Now, which is a central bank digital currency in theory that could get introduced. And imagine you're using it and you spend $100 of it on something but the moment you spend that the government knows exactly what you just bought where you were what happened in that moment and if you do anything the government does not like maybe you're at a protest and they don't like that you were protesting there they could violate your rights and shut off your access to your money in theory this is all in theory right but we want to be ahead of this we want to be seeing that possibility before it happens and i think um, RFK Jr. Has been, is quite prescient on this topic. And he also talks about how, you know, like Bitcoin and other decentralized um, crypto assets are, you know, represent a kind of freedom. It's kind of a way for Americans to say, hey, I, I do not want my wealth and my spending power to be inflated away. In other words, for my money, my purchasing power to go down by the Federal Reserve and the printing of the U.S. dollar. So I want to be able to have this alternative store of my wealth. And um, and RFK Juniors, I, I don't know if there's any other politician out there who has so forcefully commented on this. And this was just in one tweet, but it was such a, a such a thoughtful and, and well-constructed tweet. I, I encourage you to look it up on your own to, to gain a little more info. Um, but Jay, that was great. I think uh, John, is that, John, are you our next uh, speaker? John McCarthy? Hey, John. John, you're muted, but if you want to jump in, you are welcome to do so. Yes, hello. Uh, I just wanted to address what you were saying earlier about uh, Trump tearing up all those uh, arms control treaties. And really, that has a lot more to do uh, with the war that we're in right now than even all the provocations we did in, in Ukraine. Is The Russians feel very unsafe because we... Uh, basically walked away from arms control. And uh, I know Scott Ritter has been uh, stressing a lot lately who, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's been promoting uh, JFK Jr. Uh, he's saying if we don't get back into these arms control treaties soon uh, or create new ones, we're, we're all dead. And uh, it, um, it makes me feel good that our RFK Jr. has a relationship with Scott Ritter. I, I think, uh, well, I know he, if he becomes president, we'll get back in these treaties and uh, war, uh, nuclear war will be a lot less of a possibility than it is right now. Absolutely. And, you know, Scott's not waiting for the next administration to do something about it. Uh, he is taking it on his own initiative to go to Russia personally. And uh, he's trying to get his visa and his paperwork all ready right now. He's, he's not waiting for 2025, which is what I've been hoping somebody would step up and do. So, Applause for Scott Ritter once again, and I hope that uh, Bobby will make him our next Secretary of Defense. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> that that would be quite a quite a moment. I mean, th there's I, I read somewhere. Some, so I, I'm trying to remember who was the author of this, but the comment the comment was like there would be no greater or more profound redemptive arc in American public life in the last century then rfk jr becoming president right if you really think about the, what happened mm -hmm. to his uncle what happened to his father 
And now we have this moment. And we talked about this in our initial Twitter space, Lori, but um, you know, the, 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 the sort of eerie alignment around the uh, con- the Democratic Convention will be in Chicago of all places, which is where it was yeah. in 1968, just after after um, Junior's father was was assassinated. Um, Isn't but, that strange? Uh, but, I yeah, just got so, a chill down my spine when you said right? that. But but yeah. what a redemptive arc! And then the other redemptive arc that relates to John's comment, which you know, to me, there would be nothing more poetically beautiful than. Um, RFK Jr. achieving his uncle's ultimate, what what was JFK's ultimate dream? In my opinion, his ultimate dream was the abolition of nuclear weapons. So to not just prevent, it's almost like we have Cuban Missile Crisis 2.0, much worse happening right now in the form of this proxy war um, with with, uh, Ukraine and Russia. And gosh, I do hope that gets resolved before January of 2025, because I don't know if we can wait that long. But um, but when RFK Jr. comes into the White House, maybe he resolves that proxy war if it hasn't already been resolved. But to go to say, you know what, we need to change the course of history here. We need to get to a point where we have a global approach to peace and security and cooperation that includes the global abolition of nuclear weapons. And that has to include a lot of regional conflict resolution to sort of reduce, um, to sort of, to transform the conflicts and get to durable agreements for all of the states that currently possess nuclear weapons, including including other others who have you know hostility, which is a whole separate topic, which I might save. But um, is there anyone else who wants to come up um, and talk? Because we're going to probably wrap it up pretty soon. We're getting close to eleven p.m. here on the East Coast. And I yeah, I was hoping Jeff sleeping. Norman might hop in for a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, Jeff, we're talking about you're invited. You're invited, but no, no pressure, Jeff. But raise your hand no or pressure, anyone Jeff. else who wants to. I'll send Jeff an invite, but Jeff does, certainly doesn't have to. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this. I'm not seeing any hands, Lori. So I'm going to make this kind of last call here. Is there anyone else who who wants to speak? Please not speak now or hold your peace until the next one. Until next Monday night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, well, Lori, do you have any closing thoughts before we before we wrap up here? Well, I just want to thank everybody who tuned in, and uh, I hope that you'll share this Twitter space after it ends. We recorded it, so anybody can listen back to the playback at any time. And I hope uh, I will be also recording and and uploading these Twitter space campaign meetings to my YouTube channel so that we'll have them on another platform outside of Twitter for people who don't use Twitter um, or just in case uh, Twitter decides to ban this account at some point in the future. Uh, I think Twitter only archives spaces for like 30 days or 60 days. And after that, Twitter deletes them. So they'll be archived forever on my YouTube channel and on my Rumble channel. So if you missed it, you can listen over there as well. And hopefully, I know that Matthew is going to be at the event in Boston. And I think he's also uh, going to the meet and greet with the candidate, Mr. Kennedy, um, after the event. So hopefully we can have... Matthew, join us on Maverick News to do sort of a recap uh, that evening. But uh, I'm, I'm going to try and work out the scheduling with you, Matthew, and get you on the show as our reporter on the ground from Boston. Well, we, let's talk about that offline. And certainly, I, for those of you here, just go ahead and mark your calendars for a week, a week from today, Monday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 Central, 6.30 Pacific will be our, our next RFK All The Way Twitter space. And actually, Lori, you know what? Why don't we do, if you're up for it, if you have any more gas left, let's do another five to ten minutes and we'll do an after show. And here's what the after show is, if you're up for it, is horse race. We didn't do any horse race yet, and I have a few thoughts about the horse race. Do you want to do some horse race, or are you ready to crash out? No, I'm good. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, all right. So this is now, this begins the after show. The after show is horse race analysis, because that's always part of covering a campaign. It's kind of looking at... What's the path from A to B to C? A is where we are today. B is Bobby is the nominee of the Democratic Party. And C is he is inaugurated in January of 2025. Okay, so I'm going to lay out the horse race for you. Um, It is a shockingly clear path to victory on all fronts. I mean, I can't even imagine a weaker and I mean weaker politically um, incumbent president than President Biden. You know, he. Mm-hmm. It, it, it seems to me like this horse, the horse race situation is eerily similar to, um, 
1968, where you had LBJ, whose popularity was a mile wide and paper thin. You know, he, by 1968, boy, LBJ was in a lot of trouble, right? And, but still, that, that the extent of his trouble was not clear to the political punditry until not Bobby, but Gene McCarthy really hurt him politically in the first primary in New Hampshire. Now, Gene McCarthy didn't win, but he he got in, he came close. He got 40 something percent. He came close enough to LBJ that it was a political earthquake and it showed how vulnerable LBJ was. Bobby, um, Bobby Sr. jumped into the presidential race shortly thereafter and then LBJ withdrew. Um, although, as we were discussing, Lori, there is a very interesting uh, historical postscript to that, which is I recently uh, saw a documentary on Lady Bird, on LBJ's wife. And she, during this, she had recorded a whole bunch of tapes while she was in the White House. And she said in one of those tapes that after LBJ became president, after the Dealey Plaza disaster on November 22nd, 1963, that shortly after that, she and her husband had a conversation where she had urged him to only run once, run in 64, but not run again in 68. She had told him she wanted him to be a one, sort of a, a one, oh, I guess a term and a half, a term and a third president. Um, so there was already this idea between the two of them, apparently, that he wouldn't run again in 68. But still, you know, by 68, uh, the Vietnam War was deeply unpopular and he withdrew. So anyway, so here's, you know, here's where I, that yeah, comes Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add to that. I'm, I'm looking right now, I looked up President Johnson's approval ratings from late 67 going into early 68 and yeah in uh, at the time he dropped out of the race at the end of march 1968 his approval ratings were about on par with where joe biden's are right now at about <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know? well, well and, and i think you know if you look at biden um, I, I mean, obviously, there, he doesn't have any Republican support. His independent support, I mean, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but I don't, I don't imagine it's that high. But what you really find out once you start digging into his approvals is there's a lot of Democrats who really kind of wish they had another option, right? So they might, they might on one hand say, yeah, I support you know, the president. They might say that. But then if you really start asking them, they do want another option. And so I think that, that once Bobby, there's a, a sort of a critical mass behind Bobby that that him as a, as a as a viable option is going to suddenly become very clear it's going to have I, I believe the country has a muscle memory for the expression President Kennedy you know obviously from JFK but also from RFK's can, RFK seniors campaign so I think there's a muscle memory there that will sort of kick in when RFK Jr. steps into the light and certainly by the time we get to the debates, if there is even is a debate, and I've I've read rumors, and I don't really know what's going on here, but I read a rumor that the Democratic Party is is you know trying to like not have any debates. They're literally the trying to do that. Yes, they. Th mean, this Biden is does this not is want to debate Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> I mean, I think I think if they go that far, it would expose the Democratic Party as such a, a threadbare undemocratic organization. And we've seen this over and over again. It's almost like the Democratic Party is tripping all over itself to delegitimize itself. You know, and it it, 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 it comes in all these sort of insidious ways with, with super delegates who can sort of counteract the actual will of the people. It comes in situations where I, I remember seeing something where there was one, at least one state where Bernie won more votes than Hillary, but somehow Hillary ended up with more delegates than Bernie. It's and and it mm -hmm. comes in, you know, these leaks that we found out where, you know, the the the, the I, I, I guess the allegation was that Hillary had been given certain questions ahead of time, so she knew what was the questions that were going to be asked in the debate, but Bernie didn't yep. know the questions. Donna Brazil I mean, confirmed a, that. The, you know, there's all these kind of ways, but it's it's almost like for the average person who's not paying a lot of attention. Are they aware of how undemocratic the Democratic Party fundamentally has has shown itself to be at various points? And certainly, you know, of of all of them in 68, I mean, my gosh, in 60, you know, when you had the, the, the 68 Democratic Party convention just meltdown, a lot of that was, at least my understanding of history, and I know we may have a slightly different take on this, Lori, but my understanding of that history is that if you add up sort of all of the support that both Bobby, who was an anti-war vote, and Gene McCarthy, who was an anti-war vote, 
Um, if you add all of that up, it was a, it was a much sort of criti bigger critical mass of support within the Democratic Party in 1968 than Hubert Humphrey um, had. And I know you say, Lori, when we were talking earlier, I remember you saying that Hubert Humphrey kind of eventually came around to opposing the Vietnam War. He but did. certainly, but certainly in the summer of 68, and you know. Um, he, he was, but it was, was too he late. Was sort of, yeah. It was in the and fall. well, well, well he, yeah, well, here's my, I want to go to the summer of 68 at the convention at the convention. Hubert Humphrey was a continue the LBJ policy candidate. He was a continue the Vietnam policy candidate, whereas Gene McCarthy and, and Bobby Kennedy, both of them were, were very much opposed to the Vietnam war policy. And so, there, you know, and that was why the summer of '68, why that convention turned into such a chaotic tragedy, was because yeah. of the sense that so many young people had that the the whole thing was rigged. That that the party bosses were choosing the party decides. Isn't there a book called The Party Decides? The party had decided to sort of anoint Hubert Humphrey, despite the fact that the base and and the Democratic will inside the Democratic Party was for for an anti-war candidate, and when when Bobby Kennedy was tragically eliminated, and that's a whole other story, um, that it would have been Gene McCarthy who could have carried the anti-war um, torch. So, so, so the point of all of that is just to, br and I do want to hear your comments on that, Lori, but just to bring it back to present tense, um, if we end up in a situation where the Democratic Party literally, literally deletes and does not schedule, does not hold a single debate, how could any member of the Democratic Party relate to it as anything other than an autocratic farce. Yeah, I have to agree with you. And, you know, President Biden, if he has any marbles left, if he hasn't completely lost his, his marbles, he should just pull an LBJ. He should decline to run again this year. He should read the writing on the wall. For one thing, he's too old. He, for another thing, he's incredibly unpopular um, and uh, he needs to get out of the way and let younger leadership go for the, the top job. Um, I also wanted to mention, but, you know, this this corruption in the Democratic Party, this uh, the nominees being picked by party insiders this is as old practically as the party itself. And certainly I would I would encourage people to go back on YouTube and watch the Democratic Convention of 1980, and it's all available. There's many, many hours of it, several nights of the coverage, um, and just watch the way that Ted Kennedy was treated when he mm. challenged Jimmy Carter for the nomination. A very similar scenario there in 1980 as well as 1968. You had a very unpopular Democratic incumbent president, Jimmy Carter, who was being challenged from the left within his own party by a Kennedy Ted Kennedy was trying to wrest the nomination away from him. And boy, were there some shenanigans being pulled by those party insiders to make sure that that Jimmy Carter was, in fact, the nominee. But, uh, you know, I, wow. I'm not so sure that uh, <laughs> most Democrats really wanted him. There was a very strong showing for for Senator Ted Kennedy in 1980 as well. So, so yeah, I expect them to do that again. <laughs> So um, I, I see we have a hand from Alex. Alex, please kindly um, wait just a moment because I want to finish a few more thoughts on the horse race and then we'll take your comment or question. So if we look at the thing, and thank you for all that, Lori. I'll have to go, go look up what happened with Ted Kennedy. It was a little bit before my time, but I, I would like to research that. I remember um, it well. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it well. I'm old. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I think I was in like first grade when that was going on, but it uh, would be a fascinating. I mean, I've, I've been catching up on my Kennedy history. Believe me, I've been reading a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, I was but, in seventh grade at the time, yeah. and I was a big supporter of Teddy. You know, I supported Carter yeah. in 76, uh, actually yeah. campaigned for him as a little kid. Um, but uh, Carter let me down. He was my first political heartbreak. I had all yeah. my hopes pinned on Jimmy Carter, and boy, did he let me down. So um, well, when Ted Kennedy challenged him, I was on Team Kennedy. Right. Well, you know, if we're, if we're going to talk a little bit about past heartbreaks, I'll just say that um, Bernie in 2016, and especially Bernie, in, oh my gosh, Bernie 2020, mm. felt like the most heartbreaking political rug pull imaginable because he saw Bernie romp to victory, right, in Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada. So he was 
3 and 0, right? And I was counting all the chickens directly to the White House. I was certain Bernie was going to be not just the Democratic nominee but the next president. I was certain of that and oh boy that didn't work out. So so having said that with a big caveat, I'm going I'm going to say here now, I'm going to call it that RFK Jr. will be the next president and in terms of the horse race dynamic um, what I see happening is that he is going to explode in the polls upward he you know we, we looked at the polls recently and there was that morning consult poll where basically immediately yeah. after he you know he again his announce his official announcements Wednesday this was just based on him having filed some paperwork and some you know and 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 the reporting that he'd filed paperwork Work, he's at 10% instantaneously. This is a very, very good sign. Starting at 10% as an outsider candidate is a good sign. The other thing is, he said um, that he will be the Donald Trump of this, the Democratic Donald Trump of this race. And I want to state clearly what I believe he meant by that. I don't believe he was literally comparing himself to Trump, especially not personality wise. I think what he means is in terms of the way an outsider can come in and gravitate an enormous around amount of energy for reforming a broken party. Because when Trump came in, his way of doing that was to point out the bankruptcy of the neocons and you know the the the, the wars in Bush, right? He Trump went after Bush. Trump's criticism of Bush and literally of Jeb Bush was one of the many things where Trump came in and said, you know, there's a a different way to be a Republican than this. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with Trump as a person. I'm saying that that was appealing politically. And I do think there will be something politically appealing about having an outsider who is a Kennedy, who is presenting also, if you look at RFK Jr., he is such a statesmanly way of speaking and communicating. He has really got a laser voice. But you'll notice that he doesn't get enraged. He doesn't look like he's flying off the handle the way he, tra- he has a very cool, calm, that attorney demeanor. But you can feel his heart. You can feel his passion. It's very focused energy, right? And he's also intellectually i mean he's an intellectual giant so it is a total mismatch it is a total mismatch between his intellect which even if we had biden from 20 years ago biden from 20 years ago (laughs) wouldn't stand a chance intellectually with um, with rfk jr but certainly the biden of today is uh everyone knows that that the light bulb is not fully on that's a little dim over there And, and um i will say having gone through the absolute tragedy the the heart-rending tragedy of watching a close relative fade and pass away from dementia it is i think it is one of those Mm -hmm. elephants in the room it's one of those taboos it's one of those things people don't want to say president biden looks like He's got something going on in that area. People don't want to say it who are close to him. It's like, you know how like you've got the grandpa where you need to talk to grandpa because he probably shouldn't have a driver's license. I, th- you know, even if you set aside all of the reasons Biden is really off base for America in terms of policy, you can criticize his policy. I don't know that someone who is in his particular stage of cognitive apparent cognitive decline should be running any country period even if you thought his policies were the greatest in the world um, as a matter of fact yeah let me jump in and, and remind you of that new rasmussen poll that shows in all the way across the board 62 percent of democrats want another democrat to primary joe biden thank 71% you 71 percent of republicans want to see that and 64% of independents also want him gone. So that's a, a majority across the board that say Joe Biden needs to go. And you know what's really exciting? That morning consult poll where Bobby came in with you know 10% right out of the chutes, that's awesome. But the Rasmussen poll is even more encouraging. And that was taken a Absolutely. few days after the morning consult. This was conducted, it's a survey of 950 likely voters in the United States conducted between April 9th and 11th. And in that poll, they were asked specifically about Robert Kennedy and 25% of Democrats, that's a quarter of Democrats, 
already strongly support him. 27% somewhat support him. So that's a really good start. That's almost half of Democrats right there. But I think let's clarify to get their votes. Let, let me let, and let's clarify one thing about it about that poll. The Rasmussen was worded slightly differently. It was it wasn't like the morning consult was? I, I'm pretty sure was like, would you vote for? Whereas this was, would you support Bobby running? So it's almost like, do you want to see him in the race? So it wasn't as if we had 52, you know, it was 25 plus 27. It wasn't like we had a majority of Dems already saying they were going to vote for Bobby. It was more like they just like, I want to give this guy a chance. But that's a still a very, very good sign. And I and I think we're going to see a, a very quick movement. I want to just share. So here's my quick prediction. If I had to. like, Oh, just one thing with, I want to add yeah. on that poll. It's also important what Republicans and independents think, because he's going to need to win those votes as well. Uh, 13% of Republicans strongly support Bobby getting into the race. 27% also somewhat support him. And on the independent side, um, again, really good. 15% say that they strongly support Bobby's entrance into this race. 29% somewhat support it. So you add together, if you just take the lines of those who strongly support his campaign, those if they strongly support him running, I think it's pretty likely that they're going to vote for him. Um, that's 53% right there. So that's the horse race. So uh, actually, I don't think it's, I'm sorry, I, the strongly support numbers, I think you would have to sort of do a blended average to come up with a, it's, you know, if you. Yeah, write, that's just straight you know, math. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that wouldn't be the, the, the way to look at it would be like, okay, of all the people who are likely voters in the general election of November 2024, what percent of those people strongly support? And it probably comes out to like 15 to 20 percent. But but I think the more important point is actually if you add it all out, if you just say either somewhat or strongly support, which really says, are you potentially willing to, to you know, is he a real consideration for a vote? You're already at the 50 percent. But I'm just going to um, I know we need to wrap up here in a moment and we've got a hand from from Alex. So I just want to finish my, my quick thought on where I see the race going and then we'll bring Alex up. Um, here's my prediction just based on well, what happens between today and November of 2024. My prediction is Bobby jumps in and the heat starts turning up on Biden. And it becomes a little bit of a frantic thing for Biden and his team where Bobby is gaining support. So then they start throwing their muck at him. And I think fundamentally the muck ultimately will not stick because I think the American people will be more interested. And I, and I actually don't want to get into any muck stuff during this talk, Lori, by the way. But I just want to say we can anticipate there will be muck thrown, but Bobby will get through it because the American people will be more interested in what he represents and what his policies are than the muck. And then I think what will happen is Biden will drop out. And then I think we're going to have an absolute sort of Almost like um like a, a, a like a bunny explosion. It's like there's you know, you know it's like remember the remember the Democratic primary of 2020 where it was like there was more Dems running at one point than you could possibly keep track of. It was like wait, yeah, there's something like, like there were like there were like governors yeah. there was like governors you'd heard of once in your life and they were up on and there was like so many people up on stage that it was very hard to moderate. I think there's gonna be like you know the Gavin Newsoms, the Pete Buttigiegs, the Kamala Harrises, and a bunch of other people are going to jump in. But then the fundamental d- dynamic is almost going to be like Trump in sixteen, where Bobby is going to be this one singular voice who's going to be talking about things like we need to not have an imperium abroad and we need to have a democracy at home. And here's what I mean by that: like he's going to be saying that, and nobody able, nobody's going to be able to like rebut him or debate him because almost all of them will have already kind of um, shot themselves in the foot with their poor voting record. You know, in other words, all these people who have been sort of voting the wrong way in terms of um, the military industrial complex and sending unlimited amounts of of weapons to Ukraine. You know, we had a situation where, if I remember correctly, we had the alleged progressive members of the Democratic Congress issue a letter demanding negotiations saying there must be a negotiated settlement and then they retracted that letter under yeah. pressure so we've yeah. had so we've had progressives caving over and over again on that topic so i think bobby is just going to stand head and shoulders above them all and i think he's i think he's going to win and then once you get to the general election i think ultimately the reason that if there is one reason Bobby will beat Trump, and I do think it will be Trump, look at his momentum. 
the reason I think Bobby is going to beat Trump is that the middle ground of America, in other words, those who um, are independently minded and don't always vote exactly the same way, they don't always vote for the same party every time because they're the ones who decide presidential elections, right? It's not it's not the D tribe, it's not the R tribe, it's the people who kind of like kind of reserve judgment until the last two weeks of the campaign. They're going to want a presidential president instead of a bombastic, ang sort of angry, attacking president. And I think Bobby Kennedy is like the kind of person where you say, fundamentally, do you want him to be a role model for your kids or do you want Trump to be a role model for your kids? And I think Bobby is a much better role model for people's kids. And that's why I think um, in terms of just how he comes across, how his his demeanor and his gravitas, I think. Um, will we'll be, we'll be what is the deciding factor and I'm not saying that's what the deciding factor it should be like the deciding factor should always be uh, be policy questions but I think and, you know once you get to that presidential horse race level where there's a lot of very very low information voters who don't really pay a lot of attention I think they kind of vote with their gut based on these sort of intangible factors and I think that will be one of them that really puts Bobby over the edge so that's the last thing I want to say about the horse race before we um, give give Alex a chance but is there anything else you want to say about the horse race Lori before as we start to wrap up our after show here yeah just real quick I want to say that uh, I think our biggest enemy is not even the Democratic Party machine um, our biggest enemy is the voters distrust of the vote hmm. I think especially after the 2020 election so many voters and, and there's a lot of apathy out there there's a lot of anger out there since Bobby, you know, started exploring the possibility of running for president, I've probably talked to a hundred different voters who say, I really like him. I hope he wins, but I will not vote. I will not vote. And they say they either won't vote for a Democrat because they hate the Democratic Party that much, or they just won't vote at all because after what happened in 2020, they don't have any faith or any trust that the elections are honest anymore. And, you know, I can't say as I blame them. But that's going to be our greatest challenge is to motivate people to go ahead and vote. Give it another try. Get registered. Cast your vote. It's the only way to, to try and make your voice heard. Yes, they rig elections at the local level, at the state level, and, and probably at the federal level, too. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And obviously, Bobby thinks so, too, or he wouldn't have gone. He wouldn't be putting himself out there, sticking his neck out to run. Um, knowing all the challenges that he's up against. But I, I think our greatest task is those of us who support him as we, you know, it's going to be getting people registered to vote and convincing them to vote. That's really, really going to be a challenge. I think it's our greatest challenge. Interesting. Well, I think that's always a challenge for every campaign ever, right? Like, I think that's almost like, yeah, of course, like getting people registered and getting people to vote is, you know, turnout is always a challenge. However, to the extent that there are people who rightly or wrongly, and I don't take a position on this at all. I have no position on this because it's not something I've researched. I don't, you know, but to the extent that there are people who distrust the electoral process, that means there are certain going to be a certain number of people who don't vote. And there always are a certain number of people who don't vote. Um, I, I think taking into account the people who do vote and who don't vote, I think as long as the voting machines are working properly and there's some honest reporting going on, Bobby wins. <laughs> Bobby wins on every level. And and that's the vision I have. And that's the vision I'm, I'm holding for us and for this space. Um, Alex. I think his hand's getting tired. Hey, yeah, thanks for, thanks for waiting so long. I yeah. had that hand so, up forever. I want to say this first. I understand. I used to be, just a year ago, I was saying, like, I would never vote Democrat ever under any circumstance after Bernie. But it's like, look, I want to say this to everyone here. There's no reason you can't register for primary ones. Vote like, In my state, you can literally just register and unregister from any party at moment's notice. So what I can literally do is I can vote RFK in the Democratic primaries. Then once that, end, once that ends, then when the Republican primaries begin, I can vote for like the most anti-establishment Republican, whether that be Trump or someone else. And I would actually recommend everyone do that here if their state ballot laws allow them to. Just go in every primary, vote for the most anti-imperialist candidate or the most anti-establishment or just the most chaotic candidate possible and just see what happens. And by the way, do I expect RFK to win the primaries? No. But I'm voting 
knowing that you won't win, but knowing that you will cause, you will give people, you will cause people, you will cause the average American, especially the average Democrat, to have a lot of questions about how their own party works. And in that way, I support him. I fully support what RFK is doing. I obviously, there are very few Democrats. I live in California. There are tons of Democrats who run all the time here. The only other Democrat I've ever been enthusiastic about has been Geoff Young, and he's not even from my state. He's from Kentucky. So it's like, look, we don't have much here at all, but I'd be happy to come. First of all, I'm already vo- I've already volunteered to support RFK, but what I want to say is this. For everyone here, even though it's possible for voting to be rigged, right? But you should still support, you should still vote for the most anti-establishment candidate possible, even if it's rigged, just for the slight chance that it does screw something up for the system. Because remember, if, if even if RFK gets like 30% of the vote, people, that's a big enough margin, that's a big enough voter margin for people to start having questions. Because then people will start assuming it's rigged. And honestly, all I hope is this. RFK better not concede. And RFK better fight. Like Even after the primaries are over. I hope he does like a full Trump or whatever. And just well, maybe not deny the results of the primary. Alex, can you, can, can, you, can, you bring it to, Alex can you bring it to a wrap? Right. Any final words? And... Oh, I apologize. I'm just saying. Yeah. All I'm going to say is for everyone here, it may... Look, you may be pessimistic about voting and everything, but just vote RFK in the primaries and unregister after you're done. Yeah, I have to agree. Thank, I, thank I'm you. one of those Democrats who I, I left the Democratic Party in 1996. I became a libertarian and I have not voted for a Democrat in 27 years, guys. That's how much I hate the Democratic Party. OK, but I'm going to do it. I mean, Bobby's going to be the first Democrat I voted for in 27 years. And I may, you know, I don't know how long I'll last as a Democrat. Uh, probably as long as Bobby does. As long as he's in the party and he's running, I will have, I, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll do it. I will vote Democrat. Um, but, you know, then we have to cross that bridge after the convention. What happens well, then? You know, and that's that's a topic for maybe next week is, you know, would there actually be any chance of a Trump Kennedy ticket in the fall, a unity ticket? Yeah, I, I just want to say, Lori, absolutely not. That is not something that we're going to. But well, you can you can envision whatever you want, Lori, I, for myself as the host. of this Oh, space. believe me, I, I, I just want to be I want to be ab- I want to be absolutely clear. I want to be absolutely clear about a couple of things in terms of both what my vision is and kind of what. The, the sort of the, the basic sort of approach for these spaces will be in the future, okay? So the first thing is this space is about Robert Kennedy becoming president of the United States of America. You know, I don't remember who, who it was who said this. It was, it was, it was from one of the, the Democratic primaries in the past. But, I, you know, I think maybe it might have been like one of Jerry Brown's races or something. But it was like the, the question was like, do you want to send them a message or do you want to send them a president? This is not a protest campaign. This is not about sending a message. This is about revolutionary change in this country. This is about restoring American democracy. This is about taking back control from the military industrial complex that has run this country ever since November 22nd, 1963. Dwight Eisenhower warned us about the danger of the military industrial complex in not just endangering our democratic liberties, but subverting and transforming them. And, you know, RFK Jr. himself has said that was the most important speech any president has ever given. He did not say his uncle's peace speech, which in my opinion actually was the most important speech ever given. He didn't say that. He said Dwight's. Why did he say that? It's because he's pointing to the fundamental nature of what we are dealing with. We are dealing with a fake democracy. We're dealing with a non-democracy. The reason so many people, in my opinion, like you, Alex, ultimately, ultimately are alienated from the entire process is because it's all a farce. It's all a facade. We can't really talk about anything in our country without talking about what's beneath the surface, what's driving the whole thing, what the system is. What the system is, is a military industrial complex running our country to to ensure we are in one way or another, in a perpetual state of war and money is always being funneled to the military industrial complex 
And if the facade politicians who are figureheads want to have a debate about other stuff, like what the tax rate should be, fine. But as long as they get to have their ongoing war machine, they can they run everything. So that's that's what we're up against. And so I really don't want to I don't want these spaces to get too distracted into hypotheticals. I don't want these spaces to become distracted into, well, could Bobby run as an independent if he doesn't win the Democratic nomination or could he be the vice president of the uh, under Trump? I actually am going to like not have us have those conversations because I want to I want to bring the conversation back to what we are envisioning, what we are calling in and what we're supporting. This is a biased space. It's not a space that is looking at this objectively. It is subjectively a pro-Kennedy for president space, and we're going to stay focused on that. And And I want to encourage everyone here, at least from my perspective, to believe and feel that this is going to happen and put all of your energy into that. Put all of your energy into President Kennedy Jr. on in January of 2025, and we're going to make that happen. So that's that's kind of what I want to say to sort of final comments here. <laughs> I hope that was okay, Lori, that I got a little bit passionate here and uh, had a Hey, I love passion. We need that. We need a lot of that. And people are so apathetic and so angry at their government and at the elections right now. When I talk to people who really hate the Democratic Party and I try to convince them to support Kennedy, the way that I approach it is I tell them that I've, you know, this would be my first time voting for a Democrat in 27 years. That usually gets their attention. And I also try to convince them that you got to vote for the person, not the party. And so I encourage everyone to check out Bobby Kennedy, you know, look at where he's at on the issues, make up your own mind and, you know, try to do that based on your instincts about people. You know, I, I would encourage you to vote for the best man, not the party. And I, I believe that Bobby Kennedy is the best man. Yeah. And, and, to, and to build on that a little bit, um, just speaking for myself here, fundamentally, there is almost nothing about the Democratic Party in and of itself that in any way inspires or motivates me to get out of bed and get excited because I have not heard any of what Bobby is saying from anyone who is currently who currently holds elected office across the board. And that includes, unfortunately, Bernie Sanders, who at this point has become someone very different than the person who I remember during the 2020 campaign. Um, so, you know, I, I, I want to just say that I, I'm here to support Bobby Kennedy Jr. I'm not here to support the Democratic Party. What I do support, though, is what I would say is it's almost like a jujitsu move or a, a power move or a, a reform. Like if Bobby becomes the democratic nominee for president in 2024, he is de facto the leader of the democratic party, whether the party bosses really want that or not. That is, that is yeah. the case. That's always <laughs> been the case. It is always the case that the party has a new head at the convention that has always traditionally been the case. And so if Bobby says, this is the vision for America, this is the vision for this nation, this is what the platform for America is, then that suddenly kind of becomes also the platform for the Democratic Party. And there may be, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just going to put out the possibility that we may see some unexpected miracles. We may see some say, we may see some members of the party, members of Congress, representatives and senators who suddenly find the courage that they did not have or that they stuffed down as they fed from the trough of the donations from corporations and from industry. They might suddenly say, you know what? The water's safe. The water is safe because Bobby Kennedy is making the water safe. I'm going to go over there because I actually want to stand for that platform instead of who I used to stand for. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm not saying, but but I think it's possible. And I think we actually could see kind of a, a transformation of the Democratic Party. So, you know, I'm not. So you're saying a that, few of them uh, might find their backbones? You mean? Yeah, yeah. We might, we might get that spinal transplant. That I, <laughs> you know, who that was. I'm trying to remember who it was who talked about. It. Oh, it's, that was Howard Dean. See that if you go back to you know, for I, I, I mentioned my Bernie 2016 and 2020, um, you know, involvement. But uh, going yeah, back to the, Bernie, to, to 2000, 2004, it was funny because Howard Dean kind of 
caught my eye before Dennis Kucinich did. And Dennis, I actually really like Dennis's anti-war and a lot of his, you know, Department of Peace and a lot of his other stuff. But I, I kind of thought Dean might might actually have a chance to win. So I kind of got behind Dean. And I remember, you know, he gave this really firebrand speech about how um, members of Congress needed to needed a spinal transplant. They needed to get their backbones and and oppose George W. Bush. I and remember the war that. Scene. That was that was a good one. Yeah, but you know, that was but good. so so I feel like we've had these little moments, these little flashes of this possibility in people like. Um, Bernie and Howard Dean and Dennis and um, some of, you know, Barbara Lee at to- at times, although not as much recently, but, but really it's, 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 it's almost completely gone. There's almost nothing to be found anymore in the democratic party, but maybe it does get rebooted in some way as a result of Bobby winning. So, okay. Um, I'm done. <laughs> this has been going on for like, Lori, this has been super fun. Any final words before we say good night to our crew here? Well, yeah, um, I just wanted to leave you with uh, a quote from his dad. Um, you remember the Ripple of Hope quote? You know the one I'm talking about? Um, yeah, I was just watching that speech the other day. Yeah. yeah, the South Africa speech. I think it's a good place to end this, to ponder, um, because what you're talking about is... Wait, was, wasn't the... Wait a second. Wasn't that a Teddy Kennedy speech about Bobby? No. Or was it a Bobby speech about JFK? Hold on a second. It was a speech he gave in South Africa, Hulk. I believe, uh, 1960. It was, it, was, it was Bobby's? Yeah. Okay, it was Bobby's, it was Bobby's speech. Okay. That's correct. And he okay, said, for some reason, I thought there was a, a ripple of hope quote from Teddy's memorial to Bobby. Uh, he pro- yeah, I think he may have paraphrased that. It was a pretty yeah, famous speech. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. But right, he said, uh, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. What better way to describe the RFK Jr. for President campaign than that? He's a ripple of hope, and we need that right now. And I have hope. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm uh, in my 50s now. I've seen a lot in my political lifetime. So many politicians let me down. I'm also cynical. I'm also angry. Uh, but I'm not apathetic. And I still care yeah. very much about our country. We, we absolutely must save it. It's up to us. And I think RFK is the guy that we can count on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that based on both what you said about the the ripple of hope as well as um the kind of the cynical thing because of being let down in the past what occurs to me is that bobby kennedy jr's campaign represents real hope and real change that's right that real hope real change right not not the phony and, stuff that Barack yeah, Obama yeah well, was i'm not <laughs> we could talk about obama another time but real hope and real change and um, and Bobby is a profile in courage that for any of us who ask ourselves about what are we willing to do? How far are we willing to go? What risks are we willing to take? What are we willing to put on the line for this? Bobby was asked in an interview and you may have seen it. He said, you know, someone, he was asked, are you concerned about your physical safety? And of course there's an obvious context to that question. And mm-hmm. Bobby's just, just cold as steel. It's like, no, I'm not concerned. So Bobby is a prof- he's a living profile in courage and let yes. us draw on the inspiration of that courage and that belief that a better world is possible and a better America is possible. And, you know, we all have to encircle this man, like physically protect him by putting our bodies in front of him everywhere he goes. I mean, the, the people's secret service. I'm not going to trust the secret service to keep him safe. Um, they certainly failed to keep his uncle safe. Um, and you know, it's, we have to protect this man. We have to help him in every way that we can. And even if that comes down to physically protecting him by, by encircling him with our bodies and, and making a circle around this man to say, don't you lay a finger on this one. And, and let's have that idea be both a physical and a metaphorical one, because there are a lot of different ways to protect, stand up, and stand with this campaign many, many, many different ways. And it's going to take a lot of different people, 
with different skills and talents and availabilities all across this country to move and pl- this yeah, forward. Yeah, you know, and spiritually this, and when too. It, and when we and when and 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 when that bright, beautiful day in January of 2025 comes, it will the White House will be the people's White House again. Sure sounds good to me. I'm in. Okay. Let's win. All right. All right. Let's win it. Okay. So let's uh, let's all say good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you see you next time. Monday, 930 Eastern, 830 Central, 730 Mountain, 630 Pacific. Have a good one. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. That's good been night. Super fun. Okay, good night.